This next book is going to come out in April, and it is uh, America's Wars for the Greater Middle East. Um, and the quote that I was able to uh, pull down that was in some of the, uh, uh, the advertisements that we sent out to you by email is the question, how do you end an endless war? 30 years ago, Jimmy Carter declared the Persian Gulf a vital focus of American foreign policy. And since then, U.S. forces have invaded, occupied, garrisoned, bombed, or raided 18 different nations, absorbing thousands of casualties and getting little in return in terms of peace or goodwill. And so with that, I think we've set the stage for a pretty thought-provoking discussion. Please join me in welcoming Andy Basevich. So uh, thanks for the introduction, Chris. Uh, as, as he suggested, this is a book talk sans book, uh, because the actual book, America's War for the Greater Middle East, won't be out until the first week of April. The book purports to be a history of an event that's still ongoing, which may strike you as a tad presumptuous. I don't say so explicitly in the book, but in fact, I consider this history to be very much a preliminary account. By no means do I pretend that somehow it's definitive. And I fully expect that there will be many other such histories in years to come, written by people who have access to a far more complete documentary record than I have had. But my aim in writing this history now of an event that is still ongoing is to try to persuade these future historians and to persuade members of the general public and to persuade members of the United States military that a phenomenon that we ought to call America's war, singular, Chris, for the greater Middle East actually exists and deserves our considered study and attention. Now, my wife Nancy and I just came back from three really fun days at Stanford University where I gave two hour-long lectures one on Wednesday and one on Thursday, that, that provided what I told the audience, kind of a Cliff Notes version of this book. An hours worth of talk on Wednesday night, hours worth of talk on Thursday night. And I have here in my little red folder 41 pages of text that I am prepared to read over the next two hours which will cause you all to sit here until past 8 p.m. I'm guessing you don't want to do that. And I don't want to do that after having been talking myself to death for the last week. So, so what, I'm, what I'm proposing to do this, this evening is to give you an executive summary of the Cliff Notes version of a book that's probably going to weigh in at something like 350 pounds. 350 pages, not pounds. <laughs> probably be about a pound and a half, but it'll be about 350 pages or so. So I've extracted material from the two hours and then tried to insert little tidbits that really are, are the seams that I hope you won't uh, notice too much. And, and if it works out, we'll find out. Uh, I should end up talking for about 30 minutes or so. And if I'm able to pull that off, then that'll give us another 30 minutes or so when we can have a discussion about this subject matter. So with that, let me hop into the text. For well over 30 years now, the United States military has been intensively involved, intensively engaged in various quarters of the Islamic world. And clearly, an end to that involvement is nowhere in sight. Tick off the countries in that region that US forces in recent decades have invaded, occupied, garrisoned, bombed, or raided, 
and where American soldiers have killed or been killed. Since 1980, and as Chris suggested, that's the date when I begin my story, since 1980, they include Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, but also Iran, Lebanon, Libya, Turkey, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, the United Arab Emirates, Jordan, Bosnia, Kosovo, Yemen, Sudan, Somalia, Pakistan, and Syria. And the list just keeps on getting longer. Now, to judge by the various official explanations coming out of Washington, the mission of the U.S. troops dispatched to these various quarters has been to defend or deter or liberate, punishing the wicked and protecting the innocent while spreading liberal values and generally making Americans safe. What are we to make of the larger enterprise in which the United States has been engaged now for well over three decades? What is the nature of the military struggle that we are waging? More fundamentally, what should we call it? For several years after 9-11, Americans referred to it as the global war on terrorism, an ill-chosen term that has now long since fallen out of favor. For a brief period, during the early years of the George W. Bush administration, certain neoconservatives promoted the term World War IV. In this construct, the Cold War had been World War III. But this never caught on, in part, I think, because unlike other major 20th century conflicts, this one found the American people sitting on the sidelines. With interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan dragging on inconclusively, some military officers in the middle of the last decade began referring to what they called the long war. And while nicely capturing the temporal dimension of the conflict, this label had nothing to say about purpose, adversary, or location. And as with World War IV, the long war never gained much traction. Here's another possibility. Since 1980, back when President Jimmy Carter promulgated the Carter Doctrine, the United States has been engaged in what we should rightfully call America's war for the greater Middle East. The premise that underlies this war can be simply stated. With disorder, dysfunction, and disarray posing a growing threat to vital US national security interests, the adroit application of hard power should enable, ought to enable, the United States to check those tendencies and thereby foster conditions conducive to U.S. interests. Choose whatever term you like. Police, pacify, shape, control, dominate, transform. In 1980, President Carter launched the United States on a project aimed at nothing less than determining the fate and future of peoples inhabiting the Ark of Nations from West Africa and the Maghreb all the way across the Arabian Peninsula and the Persian Gulf to Central Asia. Since the end of World War II, American soldiers had fought and died in Asia. And even when the wars in Korea and Vietnam ended, U.S. troop contingents continued to garrison that region. In Europe, meanwhile, a major U.S. military presence dating from the start of the Cold War had signaled Washington's willingness to fight there as well. But prior to Carter's watershed 1980 statement, no comparable commitment toward the Islamic world existed, and now that was going to change. Only in retrospect does this become cl clear, of course. At the time when President Carter declared the Persian Gulf a vital U.S. national security interest, he did not intend to embark upon a war. Nor did President Carter anticipate what course the war was going to follow, its duration, costs, and consequences, much like the European statesman who just over 100 years ago touched off the cataclysm that we know today as the First World War, Carter lit a fuse without knowing where it led. Carter and his adversaries were really clueless 
as to what lay inside the Pandora's box that they chose to open. But what they and their successors down to the present moment found there prompted them to initiate a series of military actions, some large, some small, that deserve collective recognition as a war. Now, as an American, let me state plainly my own overall assessment of that war. We have not won it. We are not winning it. And simply pressing on is unlikely to produce more positive results next year or the year after. Regarding America's war for the greater Middle East, we can only say one thing with absolute certainty. It will not end anytime soon. It has become self-perpetuating. Now, questions raised by this undertaking will preoccupy and perhaps confound scholars for decades to come, in my view. And in my remarks this evening, I'll limit myself to four of the most fundamental of those questions. First, what motivated the United States to act as it has? Second, what have the civilians responsible for formulating policy and the soldiers charged with implementing policy sought to accomplish? Third, regardless of their intentions, what actually occurred? And fourth, with what consequences? In, in short, taken together, my remarks will try to link aims to actions to outcomes. Now, the United States embarked upon its war for the greater Middle East in order to preserve the American way of life. The United States embarked upon its war for the greater Middle East in order to assure access to Persian Gulf oil. Both of those statements are true. Back in 1980, the American way of life required bountiful supplies of cheap oil. Even today, whether for good or for ill, that remains the case. But back in 1980, unlike today, the approaching depletion of once plentiful North American oil reserves appeared to be an irreversible fact of life. And the implications of that apparent fact, of course it turned out not to be a fact, the implications of that apparent fact, driven home to the American consumer by the successive oil shocks of the 1970s, had vaulted the Persian Gulf into the first tier of US geopolitical interests. So just as the American Civil War was about slavery, America's war for the greater Middle East from the outset has been about oil. Of course, slavery alone does not define all that divided North and South. At stake was not simply whether people of color would be held in bondage, but which political, economic, and social arrangements were to shape the American future. Similarly, even from the outset, Oil alone does not explain what drew the United States militarily into the greater Middle East. At stake was something much more than the commodity that then lubricated the American way of life. At stake were the expectations of limitlessness that many Americans take to be part of their birthright. Recall that during the 1960s and 1970s, the United States had seemingly run headlong into limits. In Vietnam, it encountered a war that it could not win. At home, seemingly in a matter of a few short years, the golden age of post-war prosperity sputtered to an end, leaving Americans to confront low growth, high inflation, and industrial decline. The oil shocks were really the icing on an unwelcome and unpalatable cake. So the war for the greater Middle East was one expression of a collective determination to push back against these signs of beleaguerment to affirm the singularity of the United States as a nation not bound by the constraints that others are obliged to respect. In September 2001, as that conflict was entering its third decade, Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld took it upon himself to make explicit 
the rationale for the war that until that moment had been largely implicit. Speaking with characteristic crispness, crispness at, uh, I, crisp, I, I should be able to say crisp, crisply. Speaking with characteristic crispness at a Pentagon press conference, Rumsfeld explained why the United States had opted for war. We have a choice, he said, either to change the way we live, which is unacceptable, or to change the way that they live. And we chose the latter. Now, the Bush administration, this is all the way forward to 2001. Bush, Rumsfeld, Cheney, Wolfowitz, and the like. At that point, they defined US strategy with very considerable specificity. And in a couple of minutes, I'll evaluate that strategy and what it, what it uh, produced. But how about what came before 2001? during those first two decades of our war for the greater Middle East. Well, during those first two decades, which, let's do a quick inventory, included the failure of the Iran hostage rescue mission at Desert One, the unsuccessful intervention in Lebanon that resulted in the death of 241 Americans, virtually all of them U.S. Marines. The brief and inconclusive intervention in Libya, undertaken by President Reagan, really amounting to a, a single bombing raid called Operation El Dorado Canyon. The first Gulf War, in my narrative, the first Gulf War is the Gulf War of 1980 to 1988, the first Gulf War in which the United States first intervened indirectly on behalf of Saddam Hussein, subsequently intervened directly against Iran after Iraq had nearly sunk the USS Stark, killing 37 American sailors. You heard that right. We intervened against Iran after Iraq nearly sunk American warship. An episode that included a minor maritime victory on the part of the United States Navy against the Iranian Navy. This was Operation praying mantis, after which a United States Navy warship, the Vincennes, blew out of the sky an Iranian commercial airliner, killing all on board. Plus, sort of the icing on this particular cake, the first, the first Gulf War of 1988, plus the events of the Iran-Contra episode, which found the Reagan administration providing weaponry to Iran at the same time that we were providing support for Iraq, the, the belligerents in this, two, in this war. Of course, this first, this first, these first two decades of America's war for the greater Middle East also included another indirect Afghanistan, primarily by the CIA, not by the United States military in Afghanistan. Of course, looking at the Afghanistan war in a Cold War context, it ended in a great victory, leading to, in many respects, contributing strongly to the ultimate disintegration of the Soviet empire and certainly the end of the Cold War. But of course, viewed in the context of America's war for the greater Middle East, the intervention in Afghanistan in the 1980s wasn't a success. It was a debacle which stoked the fires of Islamic radicalism. This period, the first two, first two decades, also included Operation Desert Storm, the second Gulf War of 1990-91 that ended in what we thought at the time was a great historic victory, but which turned out with the passage of time to be a compromised victory that left many loose ends. Mm -hmm. 
One of those loose ends was the Kurdish crisis that followed, necessitating Operation Provide Comfort. Another loose end was the survival of Saddam Hussein, which then led to the creation of a policy of containment, the enforcement of which required US forces to remain permanently in Saudi Arabia, which then in turn led to a variety of attacks on US forces in places like Saudi Arabia, US embassies in Africa, and so on. This first two decades also included the US intervention in Somalia, 1992-1993, that ended in a rather decisive and embarrassing defeat after the Mogadishu firefight. And it also included two other Clinton uh, interventions in the fringes of the Islamic world, first in Bosnia and then in Kosovo. Arguably, you could say that both of those ended successfully. But both of these interventions on behalf of a beleaguered Muslim minority failed to have any significant effect in improving America's standing in the Islamic world. That's the first two decades. Well, what, what terms can we use to describe US military action in these first two decades? Frequent, but episodic, reactive, inconclusive, and I think most significantly, devoid of any overall design or strategic purpose. What judgments can we make about America's war for the greater Middle East during this preliminary phase? Well, I think by the end of the 1990s, several themes had begun to emerge. First, this war was unfolding in a strategic void, U.S. forces committing its purposes without any overarching sense of purpose. Second, by and large, with the single transitory exception of Desert Storm, the paltry scale of U.S. deployments and preference for relying, relying on intermediaries suggested, certainly suggested to our adversaries, either ambivalence or half-heartedness on the part of the United States. And third, as a direct consequence of points one and two, efforts to translate presumably superior U.S. military power into conclusive political outcomes repeatedly came up short. I think in some respects, the period of 1980 to 2001 in America's war for the greater Middle East is comparable to what uh, we call the phony war of 1939-1940. France and Great Britain had declared war on Nazi Germany. But during that interval, France and Great Britain balked at confronting what a war against Nazi Germany would require, and as a consequence, forfeited the initiative to the Germans, for which they paid a very steep price then when the Germans uh, invaded France in uh, the spring of 1940. Well, 9-11 ends this preliminary phase of America's war for the greater Middle East. The George W. Bush administration tries to kick things into high gear most significantly kicking into high gear meant invading Iraq. Now, given that Iraq had nothing to do with 9-11, it's important to understand why the Bush administration made the fateful decision to invade that country in 2003. And I believe it did so in order to validate three precedent-setting and mutually reinforcing propositions. First, the United States was intent on establishing the efficacy of preventive war, of showing that the Bush doctrine articulated by the President in his West Point speech of June 2002 worked. Second, the United States was intent on asserting the prerogative which it would permit to no other country of removing regimes that Washington considered odious. And finally, the purpose of invading uh, Iraq was to begin reversing the practice of exempting the Islamic world from what we might call neoliberal standards, demonstrating that what National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice called, quote, the paradigm of progress, by which she meant democracy, limited government, market econom economics, and respect for human rights, especially women's rights, that, that, that this paradigm of progress 
also called the Freedom Agenda, was as applicable to the greater Middle East as it was to the rest of the world. And here, when you think about those, those three notions, proving that preventive war works, claiming the prerogative of overthrowing odious regimes, imparting neoliberal standards on societies that previously had resisted them. What we've got here really is, in concrete and specific terms, a strategy to change the way they live, referring to Rumsfeld's comment. Now, as a venue to begin implementing that strategy, Saddam Hussein's Iraq, situated at the very core of the greater Middle East, appeared uniquely attractive. After all, Saddam had made his country an international pariah, virtually without allies or even sympathizers. No one was going to mourn his forceful removal from the scene. Further, the Iraqi army really was not likely to pose significant opposition. Having amply demonstrated its incompetence, even before taking into account the effects of periodic US bombing during the 1990s, along with a decade of crippling sanctions. That the Iraqi people were largely secular, upwardly mobile, and united in their yearning for liberation, a fanciful image nursed within the upper reaches of the Bush administration, that figured as a bonus. In other words, what made it imperative to invade Iraq was not the danger that Iraq posed, but the opportunity that Iraq presented. Try this thought experiment. Imagine that President Bush's famous mission accomplished speech of May 1st, 2003, declaring that, quote, major combat operations have ended. Imagine that that had proven accurate. Imagine that Vice President Cheney's prediction of US forces being greeted as liberators, another quote. Imagine that that had held. Imagine that Rumsfeld's projections of total war costs coming in at, quote, something under $50 billion had turned out to be correct. Imagine that Paul Wolfowitz's estimate of Iraq being able to, quote, finance its own costs of reconstruction. Imagine that that had panned out. Imagine that Under Secretary of Defense Douglas Feist's promise of the US military action, quote, putting Iraq on a path to become a prosperous and free country. Imagine that that had come to fruition. Imagine, in short, that Operation Iraqi Freedom had played out as the Bush administration expected it to play out. How would such an outcome have affected America's standing in the greater Middle East? In his classic book, Leviathan, Thomas Hobbes wrote, quote, what, co what quality soever maketh a man beloved or feared of many, or the reputation of such quality is power, because it is a means to have the assistance and the service of many. And I think this Hobbesian aphorism pithily captures the true rationale for the third Gulf War, the one we initiated in 2003. Put simply, by demonstrating the will and the capacity to deal with Iraq, the United States itself would emerge as Leviathan, thereby opening the door to much else. Indeed, the logic of the argument extended beyond such obvious follow-on targets as Libya, Syria, and Iran, ultimately nominal allies such as Pakistan, Egypt, and Saudi Arabia, each one an incubator for Islamic radicalism, that those countries were going to have to change as well. In other words, the scope of the Bush administration's domino plan was nothing if not vast. As one Bush administration official remarked, the road to the entire Middle East goes through Baghdad. Hegemony and liberation were opposite sides of the same coin. With one came the other. So with Afghanistan, 
Remember, we had gone into Afghanistan uh, October to December 2001. With Afghanistan finished, the Bush administration thought it was finished, going after Iraq emerged as the obvious and necessary next step. So by early 2002, at the latest, whether to invade Iraq was not the question, just when and how. In that sense, again, to make a World War II comparison, Operation Iraqi Freedom, in, in, in its importance to the implementation of the George W. Bush grand strategy, Operation Iraqi Freedom compares in importance to the Normandy invasion and the war against Nazi Germany. Yet in contrast to Overlord, which was designed really as a maximum effort, Operation Iraqi Freedom began as a remarkably modest affair. In terms of overall numbers, the forces invading Iraq in 2003 were one-third the size of those that Bush's father had assembled to liberate Kuwait just 12 years earlier. And this was by design and by choice. So although the invaders, or if you prefer, the liberators, quickly got to Baghdad and overthrew the Saddam Hussein regime, they proved unable to assert control over the country. And instead, by their very presence, U.S. forces incited and then found themselves enveloped by a complex, multi-sided conflict that was part civil war, part ancient sectarian squabble, and part anti-Western jihad. Now, we can argue about the date when the demise of the freedom agenda occurred. Already by the spring of 2014, the Abu Ghraib scandal had left it reeling. The accumulating cost of blood and treasure. By the middle of 2014, U.S. deaths had already exceeded 1,000. By early 2015, war costs averaged $7 billion per month. But the coup de grace came in November 2006 when American voters rebuked Bush by handing Democrats control of both houses of Congress. Bush got the message, fired Rumsfeld, and in, in doing so, in effect, uh, he gave up on achieving a precedent-setting a precedent victory in Iraq. Really, the freedom agenda was dead. Rather than a springboard, as he had intended it, Iraq had become a dead end. So Bush fired, hired a new uh, defense secretary. He hired a new field commander, already the fourth to preside over this war. In effect, to effect the salvage operation. And the salvage operation yielded the so-called surge, which created the conditions that would enable the United States eventually to withdraw from Iraq without having to acknowledge outright defeat, without having to acknowledge the impossibility of achieving the grandiose objectives that had informed the decision to invade Iraq in the first place. Yet the surge also signaled the demise of anything remotely like an overarching grand strategy to guide US policy. In other words, the only time arguing that the only time we had that strategy, however defective it was, was the interval between 2003-2007 and with the surge, strategy went away. That superior military power was going to, to enable the United States to liberate or dominate or at least pacify the greater Middle East, never less than a grandiose idea, uh, had at least been a controlling idea of sorts. And with its passing, no controlling idea remained. Now, the Iraq surge, of course, had occurred during the run-up to the presidential election of 2008, which turned out to be a referendum of sorts on the, on the war. The Democratic candidate denounced the war in Iraq as a mistake. His Republican opponent insisted that the surge, which, of course, he had ardently supported, had redeemed a failing enterprise. Notably, however, Neither candidate, neither Senator Obama nor Senator McCain, had much of anything to say about that larger war for the greater Middle East, of which the conflict in Iraq 
formed just one part. They had nothing to say about whether this larger war was going well or going poorly, about who the United States was fighting or what the United States hoped to achieve. So this larger war basically escaped notice. Of course, Barack Obama eventually won the election, and he won the election having pledged to end what he called the dumb war in Iraq and promising to double down on what he called the necessary war in Afghanistan. And when he won, he took a stab at keeping both of these promises. By the end of 2011, the last U.S. forces had indeed withdrawn from Iraq, thereby fulfilling a vow that George W. Bush himself had made years earlier. Unfortunately, conditions in liberated Iraq did not accord with what Bush had envisioned. A weak government of dubious legitimacy presided in Baghdad. Anti-government insurgents to include an offshoot of Al-Qaeda remained in the field when the Americans left. In a sense, for those of us of a certain age, it was in effect Vietnam circa 1973 all over again. In Afghanistan, uh, meanwhile, President Obama sought to apply the methods that he had faulted Bush for employing in Iraq. That's probably the solution. He organized an Afghanistan surge, appointing a new commander who vowed to apply the counterinsurgency techniques that had supposedly made the Iraq surge such a success. However, the results proved to be a bit of a bust. And President Obama's objective in Afghanistan soon mirrored President Bush's ultimate objective in Iraq, namely, get out without having to admit failure. This is another one of the seams that you're not supposed to notice. I think it was 2011 when he was announcing a timetable for withdrawing from Afghanistan. President Obama made a speech in which he said, the tides of war are receding. That turned out to be not the case. The tides of war are not receding. And the real impact of the Obama presidency on the war for the greater Middle East has, in fact, to make that war more diffuse, where we're fighting in more different places, again, arguably for less than a clearly designed purpose. What places? Well, Yemen and Somalia again, and Pakistan, another cut at Libya, Western Africa, where in the, under the Obama uh, administration, the footprint of US Africa Command has become far larger. And then, of course, there's what I would call the fourth Gulf War, which is the Gulf War which is ongoing today against ISIS, combined with yet another war in which we have involved ourselves, the civil war in Syria. And this is where it gets even more complicated. And the importance of acknowledging the specific complications that we're facing at the present moment is to appreciate the extent to which this entire enterprise has been so complicated as, I think, to really elude the understanding of the main, the main effort of the Obama uh, war effort at the present moment, of course, is directed against uh, de is defeating and destroying ISIS. The president has said that that's his objective. We've got to ask ourselves, would defeating ISIS, something which I wholeheartedly support, would defeating ISIS actually solve anything? I think probably not, for the simple reason that the conditions that gave rise to ISIS would continue to persist even if the entity that we call ISIS were wiped off the map. Yet focusing on this one specific manifestation of a larger problem actually serves to provide an excuse to skip lightly past matters of far greater moment. It's a little bit like 
foreign drug cartels and the American epidemic of drug abuse and addiction. You can pretend that attacking the former, going after the drug cartels, will reduce the latter, but you're actually kidding yourself. So you can pretend that destroying ISIS is going to fix things, but I think we're kidding ourselves. In Washington, even today, one subject in particular remains off limits, and that is the overall progress and prospects of the US military project in the Islamic world. 35 years after Jimmy Carter signed off on the Carter Doctrine, I would argue, that project appears further removed from completion than when it had begun. By almost any measure, the greater Middle East is less stable and more dangerous today than it was back in 1980. So not only have American purposes been unfulfilled, but indeed American purposes are increasingly difficult to define with any sort of specificity. Over the summer, JCS Chairman General Martin Dempsey, now retired, told a Senate committee, it's a generational problem, referring to the war. It, as Demp Dempsey had explained on another occasion, was the danger posed by what he called loosely connected groups, now catch this geographic description, loosely connected groups that run, quote, from Afghanistan, across the Arabian Peninsula, into Yemen, to the Horn of Africa, and into North and West Africa, end of quote. In other words, whether or not other US officials are willing to characterize the existence of a larger war for the greater Middle East, that's exactly what the United States finds itself involved in as General Dempsey, at least, concedes. Now, the stakes, the stakes of this struggle go far beyond the merely political, as Dempsey emphasized. This was a war of ideology and a war of religion, he said. Thwarting this group of networks, quoting now, most of which are local, some of which are regional, and some of which are global, was going to entail, in his words, a very long contest. It's already gone on 35 years. How long? How much longer than it has already run? Well, wisely, General Dempsey didn't hazard a guess. Because the truth is, no one has a clue. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you for your attention. I think Chris is going to re relay some questions. So I'd like to start the questions with a question about grand strategy. And this is a topic that we've had many authors and many military leaders talk about at the Marines Memorial Club, especially in some of our Meet the Author series. Grand strategy. In, in your opinion, who gets it? Does anybody get it? And is there anybody in the political realm in particular who can grasp grand strategy in terms of the Middle East? And, and if so, who is it? And you know, can politicians without firsthand military experience really understand modern warfare? I understand grand strategy. <laughs> uh, I actually think that uh, a, an academic understanding of grand strategy is not that difficult to acquire. It's really not rocket science in theory. The, the problem is application. And the pro application becomes a problem for a variety of reasons. One, I think, is the uh, 
the arrogance of, of policymakers, you know, the, 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 the people who get to be the national security advisor or the secretary of defense or, or whatever, to, to ascending to positions of powers, power, I think this is very human, uh, tends to play to the worst aspects of the human condition. I mean, it seems pretty clear in retrospect, and this is, this is a judgment particularly applicable to the George W. Bush administration, that they set out to do what they were going to do. They, they set out on a project to change, change the way they uh, live with an utterly inadequate understanding of the reality of the region in which they set out to plunge even more deeply than we had already gone. But I also think that application is exceedingly difficult because war itself is such a complex proposition. Force is difficult to control. Consequences are difficult to anticipate. And, 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 and that very much contributes, I think, to the difficulty. A third problem is that in the American uh, context, when we say grand strategy, people view that phrase as something that implies military action. That military force becomes a preferred option or a first option rather than a last option. In other words, we, do, we might have a better chance at successful impl imp uh, uh, implementation if we began thinking about grand strategy as something that not only precedes war but arguably makes war unnecessary, that looks to other means to address problems. I think grand, the implementation of grand strategy in American context becomes uh, even more difficult because of the sort of ideological enthusiasms that are sort of hardwired into our collective consciousness, that we have to think that we are called upon to redeem the world, spread democracy. That leads to unrealistic expectations. Again, I think particularly uh, on display during the George W. Bush administration. All of that said, to your, the second part of your question, I think I reject the proposition that you have to have had firsthand military experience to, to be a strategist, to, to have an understanding of war. And I base that judgment on the fact that our two greatest commanders in chief had virtually no military experience whatsoever. And of course, I'm referring to Abraham Lincoln, who, who, who served as a uh, militia, a captain in the Illinois militia for a handful of weeks during an Indian war and used to tell jokes about himself in his military experience. But in his management of the Civil War demonstrated sheer genius. And I refer also, of course, to Franklin Roosevelt, who never wore a uniform, who did serve during World War I as assistant, assistant secretary of the Navy, so in that sense was an observer of war. But he too, in the office of commander in chief, made mistakes, but one has to, to look back on his management of World War II and be grateful for that all that he did to, to to place the United States of America in a position of preeminence by the time the war ended in 1945, and to do that with the United States paying a remarkably small price. I mean, 400,000 Americans killed is not trivial, but compare that to what the Soviets paid as their contribution to defeating Nazi Germany. So I don't think it's the case now, what I do think is that, and this is an issue, that as a general principle, 
a country that places such a great emphasis on military power as we do would be well served by having the American elite, broadly speaking, be salted with people who have had some firsthand military experience. Members of Congress, editors of major newspapers or CEOs of broadcast networks, CEOs of, of major corporations, not, not, again, not any, or not all of them, but just sort of in general, it would be good to have the American elite include some people who have some firsthand understanding of what it is to serve in the military and what it is to, to go to war. In 2011, I was stationed in, in Abu Dhabi in the United Arab Emirates, and the Arab Spring uh, went into full force, and the aftermath of that, nobody could really understand. Everybody thought, initially, this is a, a good thing, that the yoke of dictatorships was going to be cast off, and that through, with information technologies, the, the younger generations are going to understand what... Uh, what free democratic government looks like or, or uh, a self-chosen government looks like. And then we have uh, what happened in Libya. We looked at Egypt. We look at Yemen and, of course, Syria. Uh, now all really stem back to uh, what happened during the Arab Spring and leading up to it. Is there a way to, to undo this? And you know, is it true? It's an intergenerational problem, or are there, uh, going back to Rumsfeld's quote, can, can we or should we change the way that others live, knowing that there are elements in those societies that certainly want to change the way that we live? Well, I don't think we should have been, I mean, when the, when the Arab uh, awakening occurred, I was as hopeful as other people were. That is to say, I hoped that stable democracies would emerge from the upheaval. Uh, but, but it was merely a hope and probably was not a realistic one. Why? Because, because it seems to me that democracy, let's, let we, what do we mean by that word? We mean uh, effective, legitimate governments that are responsive to the will of the people sort of an operational definition. They have to emerge organically. They don't emerge overnight. Uh, I think the notion of a, of a genuinely democratic revolution probably is an illusion. Even when we look at democracies that today we would say are successful, take our own, it is a, still deeply imperfect, and B, it took us a heck of a long time to just get as far as we are. I mean, we like to think that uh, the revolution of 1776 produced a democracy, but by golly, uh, it was a pretty limited democracy. Uh, it certainly did not include anything like the majority of the American people. Over time, through struggle, if we take the Civil War, through enormous internal violence, the United States gradually began to move somewhat closer to being a genuine democracy. So the notion that these, these things are going to happen overnight, I think, really is a, is, is a, bit, is a bit fanciful. And uh, I don't regret the hope I had, but we should, I don't think we should be surprised that things didn't turn out as they, as they occurred. So it seems to me that we should recognize that, that our ability to bring about democracy is actually quite limited. Of course, you know, the, the, the counterexample is, oh, yeah, but didn't we do that in 1945? Didn't we bring democracy to Germany? Didn't we bring democracy to Japan? Well, first of all, that claim, which, of course, is a very commonplace claim, you know, we, we, we brought democracy to these two defeated Axis allies, uh, is one that... Uh, in my judgment, does not give sufficient credit to the Germans and the Japanese who had experienced a searing defeat and, in a sense, chose to follow a path 
that aligned them with the United States. They chose, they had agency. And then the second thing, when we think about the conditions that exist in order to have those successes occur, uh, I don't know that there would be anybody who would like to see, who would like to see us, to see the planet uh, experience again d such destruction on such a horrific scale that was required to lay those countries low. Uh, certainly, I wouldn't propose, and I don't think very many people would propose, that we would consider that level of violence against our adversaries uh, in the Islamic world, if only because I'm not sure who the heck we would drop the bombs on. Uh, you know, we don't really have the kind of targets that once existed. So I, that's about the best I can do. Yep. Yeah. We talked about oil being one of the factors that got us involved in the Middle East long ago. Does energy independence for the United States and for our, our friends and allies, mainly in the West, give us the opportunity to disengage uh, from the Middle East? And, or is, is there this issue of a nuclear-armed Iran and perhaps nuclear proliferation in other Middle Eastern countries enough justification and cause for us to stay there? On the energy point, I mean, we are the most powerful country in the whole world. Bar none, no question. We will continue to be the most powerful country in the world for the rest of this century. I think there's no question about that. You know, barring some unbelievable internal collapse, uh, we will continue to be the most co powerful country on the planet. Power should provide choice. If you're powerful, you should be in a position to say, I wish to do this, I do not wish to do that. And from a position of power, you should be able to exercise those choices. And I say that because, to me, it's kind of remarkable that there is a presumption that for all practical purposes, we have no choice except to be the protector of Persian Gulf oil. And it's especially odd to think that we have no choice when, in fact, the energy regime has so radically changed in the last heck, dozen years. Because the presumption that existed back in 1980 that the American way of life was in fact dependent upon Persian Gulf oil is in fact no longer true today. Even if you want to live, even if we want to continue to have an economy and a way of life that's based on cheap energy and the burning of fossil fuels, best I can tell, there's plenty of it in North America. And indeed, we now have the technological capability to get to it. So we don't need Persian Gulf oil. It's not to say that others in the world don't, but to the extent that US foreign policy ought to be based on doing what is interest in the interests of the American people, then it really is no longer an imperative for us to sacrifice as we have sacrificed in order to maintain access to oil. Or to put it really bluntly, let those who need it begin to assume responsibility for ensuring that access. Today, in 2015, they are incapable of doing that. Why? Because we have basically allowed other nations that more or less share, share our values and share our basic commitment to the status quo, non-revolutionary powers, we have allowed them to be free riders. When are we going to insist that that regime of, of, of allowing them to uh, rely on us for their security is going to end? Can't end overnight. Can end eventually. I've, I, have, I have argued for some considerable period of time, as an example, that 70 years after the end of World War II, there's really no need for US forces to be in Western Europe. The security threats to Western Europe are not non-existent, but they're relatively minor. Vladimir Putin may be a pain in the neck, but Russian forces are not capable of advancing on the English Channel. And between them, 
the Germans, the French, the Brits, the rest of the Western Europeans, who are indeed exceedingly prosperous, could choose to defend themselves if they wish to. But they don't need to because of the US security guarantee that once was necessary, but no longer is. So I think we need to, this is not a call for isolationism. It's a call for us to focus on doing the things that we need to do and to get other people to bear their fair share of the burden. Last question, top three priorities for Middle Eastern strategy, what should they be? Well, we don't have a strategy. I mean, so I think the, fir the first priority would be, can we conceive of a strategy? And, and, and conceiving of a strategy 35 years on, given the magnitude of the errors we have made, and given the consequences of those errors in, in making a difficult problem even more difficult, you know, the strategy is, uh, it's not obvious. My own argument would be something like this, that uh, the primary objective at this point is to restore some semblance of security in the core of the greater Middle East, which really means the region around the uh, Persian Gulf. I would argue that for the st stability will come when a new equilibrium of power among the major players in the region emerges. What do I mean? An agreement to cooperate on the essentials among nations in the region that have a commitment to maintaining the status quo, that are non-revolutionary powers. Who are they? Saudi Arabia is one. Egypt is one. Turkey is one. Iraq could be one if Iraq can emerge from its current semi-chaotic state. And most importantly, and most controversially, Iran could be one. My view, if, if, even though the president won't say this out loud, is that the aim of the Iran nuclear deal is not in particular to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon, although that's a, that's, that is a good thing. But the larger purpose of the Iran nuclear deal is to invite Iran to come in from the cold, to give Iran an opportunity to demonstrate whether it wishes to play a responsible role as a nation committed to the status quo or whether it's not. Because if it is, if Iran chooses to play that role, then arguably, over a period of time, and we're talking a decade or two decades, arguably over a period of time, that equilibrium of power could emerge if Iran and, and Iraq and Saudi Arabia and Turkey and Egypt can, can come to a common vision not of peace and harmony, but of stability, thereby enabling the United States over a period of time to lower its profile militarily and ultimately to extricate ourselves from the region, militarily. Because militarily, our efforts have been counterproductive. Does that mean that the United States then washes its hands of the greater Middle East? Not necessarily. I think the second piece of a long-term strategy, in my judgment, would be for us to examine whether or not on the margins, on the margins, we can strengthen those elements within the Islamic world that are committed to embracing modernity, strengthen their hand against those elements in the Islamic world that 
see modernity as anathema. How would you do that operationally? I think one very simple way would be to maximize the number of young people from the Islamic world who can come to the United States and get an American education. Not that every one of them would go home and say, I love America. The founder of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, went to college in the 50s and was in Colorado. Yeah, and came back and, and, and committed his life uh, to op opposing America because he was so uh, turned off by our culture. But my bet would be that 90 out of 100 young Americans, and I, or, uh, young people from the, that part of the world, and I have taught some of them at BU, would actually go home, generally speaking, favorably impressed with what modernity has to offer and they're going to want more of it. And that, and that that could, again, on the margins, not in a sort of decisive way, on the margins could gradually contribute to a change in attitude within those nations with regard to the West generally and the United States specifically. That's what I think a grand strategy might look like. And the grand strategy I just described did not involve any commitment of US military power. The one thing it makes me think of that we won't go into here, but it almost presupposes addressing successfully somehow the Israel-Palestine problem before you can really put that all together. But uh, we'll save that for another day. We we'll, all, fix, we'll fix that <laughs> next week. Well, we're looking forward to this book coming out, and you've certainly caused us to think about uh, some things. Thank you for coming, and, uh, and you'll be here to sign uh, a few books. We went a little bit long, but I think it was well worthwhile. Thank you all for coming. Awesome. That was really good. Thank you.